Well, good morning, and thank you all for being here. This spring, Vermont, Vermont will join states across the country to participate in the U.S. Census. Now, this may not seem like the most exciting topic, but the consensus, uh, the census has tremendous importance to Vermont. And we've already begun work across the state uh, to be, get a complete and accurate count. In fact, the census even came up in conversations with other governors while I was there uh, in D.C. for the National Governors Association meeting last week, as well as when uh, Speaker Pelosi spoke to us as well. So I'm pleased to have so many of our state, local, and federal partners here with us today uh, to talk about this effort. Having a complete and accurate count on our population is critical in so many ways. It ensures fair representation of Vermonters at all levels of government and helps us to inform uh, us on many important decisions we make, including the level of U uh, federal funds we receive. These decisions impact our work to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable in all of our 251 towns and villages. To help get the most accurate count possible, I signed an executive order in November, creating a Vermont Complete Count Committee. And many of the members who agreed to help are here with us today. We know this will take the collaboration of uh, community leaders, nonprofit organizations, local government, legislative leaders, federal partners, and more. And this committee is working to make sure that we meet our goals. Jason Broden, our state librarian and chair of this committee, will share more on their work shortly. But in summary, this group is charged with identifying barriers to responding to the census and trying to break through those barriers so we have the highest participation possible. This includes partnering with schools and nonprofits, ensuring outreach in multiple languages, media and education campaigns, and more. And knowing certain groups are historically hard to count, this committee includes leaders and experts representing these communities in order to better reach them. I want to thank Jason and all members of this committee, including Secretary Condos and representatives from the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau, the Vermont State Census Data Center, the Office of Entrance Affairs, the Howard Center, Disability Rights Vermont, the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont, Capstone Community Action uh, Association of uh, Broadcasters, uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, Vermont AARP, Voice for Vermont's Kids, and state agencies across my administration. So with all that, I'd like to now turn it over to Secretary of State, Jim Condos. Thank you. Oli, are you all set over there? Thank you. Just making sure. Good morning. As Vermont Secretary of State and Chief Election Official, I am proud, a proud member of the Vermont Complete Counts uh, Committee. It is also important and personal for me as a second generation American as my grandparents arrived on our shores in the U.S. 100 years ago. I want to stress the importance of the census and the importance of obtaining an accurate and complete count of all Vermonters. While a once every 10 year count of every person living in our cities and towns seems abstract, the census plays a fundamental role in our democratic process. Data from the census is critical to drawing our electoral maps. Yes, I know, when it comes to Vermont's congressional map, there's really only one way to draw it. Uh, however, the accurate census data enables the Vermont Apportionment Board to accomplish its important task of configuring our legislative districts. From an election standpoint, an inaccurate, inaccurate and complete census count really comes down to ensuring fair representation, as the governor said in our political process for every single Vermont resident. For those of you who don't know me well, I have over 30 years of experience as a public servant, 18 years on the South Burlington City Council beginning back in 1989, to my eight years in the State Senate serving with the governor, uh, and now nearly for a decade as Secretary of State. I cannot emphasize how important census data is to the basic functions of our local, state, and federal government. It's the primary tool for Congress and for other federal agencies to use while making funding decisions that impact all of our citizens, our schools, our roads, and highways. Examples my colleagues and I were successful in securing recently 
securing election security funding from Congress in both 2018 and 2019, with the support and leadership of the Vermont congressional delegation, namely Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy. Vermont's funding allocation was determined in part using critical census population data. I can also tell you from firsthand experience that census data is used by our city councils, select boards, and school boards to make decisions that shape their communities in big ways and small ways. The census plays a fundamental role in our democracy. While there are some who have sought to warp the census process for political or personal gain, I am thankful that is not the case here in Vermont. During my time in public service, I have served in, in a number of national roles. I served on the board of directors of the Na National League of Cities, the board of directors of the Council of State Governments, and most recently as the president of the National Association of Secretaries of State. In those capacities, I have seen how other states handle their support for the census and have gained a national perspective. I can tell you that Vermont is ahead of the game, and that is why I'm so proud to be part of this important work. I want to thank everyone who was here for helping ensure a complete and accurate count, and thank the governor for con convening this important committee. It is now my pleasure and honor, where are you, Mason, to introduce Jason Broughton, State Librarian and the Chair of the Complete Count Committee. Good morning, everyone. All right, I'm going to use some technology here. I'm kind of moving from print to digital. And the reason why I say that is for those who are paying attention and aware, you might not know that the census will be virtual for the first time ever. So you will be able to use that digitally. You can use it on your own device or seek places where there are public, let's say, computers. And that's why libraries, in my other capacity as state librarian, will be utilized, hopefully quite frequently, for those Vermonters out in rural and remote places. It's going to be a very different type of census in which you don't have, for example, a type of card that will be sent to you first with a code. That's gone. You simply will log on and take it as you need. But there is a sequence of events that we want to make sure under the executive order that we are very inclusive, extremely accurate, and want to make sure that every Vermonter is counted accurately. So what would it count when you look at hard to count populations? Excuse me. You'd be looking for a variety of people, rural areas, remote areas, isolated, youth, transient populations, migrants, people of color, those who are disabled. All of these persons in this state should be counted on that specific day. That day will be April 1st. Yes, it will be April Fool's as a social commentary, but the census will not be fake. It will not be a joke. Within that, we're going to make sure that people understand beforehand and afterwards the importance of participating. One of our hardest groups to actually connect with will be those who distrust government. That is a very unique conversation that we will have to have with a variety of people. We have had unique questions of how many questions can you leave off and it still be counted or accurate. We would not encourage that type of thinking. We're going to ask people to fill out simply nine questions. And we have a variety of partners that we connect with for our local complete counts, from the south to the north, to the east and to the west of the state, especially of central Vermont. One asset that I would ask you to check out if you have some time would be on the census webpage in which you can actually examine the state of Vermont to see where there are locations of very low response rates. Some of those tracks are not far from here, near Barrie where I reside. You might not think that, but that means some people are saying this is not that important. For us, it is. This is funding that can be appropriated back to Vermont and utilized in a very specific way at the most useful of times, from emergencies to planning commission to boards. Without doing that, we would be hobbled. So with that, libraries will play a very unique role in helping shape a variety of access points for people to play if they are not able to have good connections or connectivity. In closing, one of the things that I would like to say is I simply will ask all of you to make sure that you make yourselves available to answer nine simple questions while living in Vermont on April 1st and thereafter. Thank you. With that, I will now introduce Michael Moser of the UVM Vermont Data Center. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Jason and I are on the statewide Complete Count Commission. and. Uh, we're really excited to be doing this work, this outreach work. The Complete Count Commission it has already met a couple times. 
we've got uh, essentially a network. We're developing a network across the state of Vermont, advocacy organizations, state agencies and departments, and really reaching out through those networks and reaching into their networks as well to um, distribute the messages that we have about the Census Bureau to the state's diverse populations and um, including all of those hard to count populations that have been mentioned. So we're really out there um, uh, meeting with regional uh, planning commissions, meeting with other complete count commissions that are local to different cities and towns across the state of Vermont. Uh, and coordinating our efforts with them. We're sharing some of the messages about safety and security of the census, sharing the message of the simplicity um, and ease of the questions and the form, and really trying to ensure that Vermonters have the best information possible um, to respond to the census uh, beginning actually uh, mid-March is when they will start sending uh, mailings out to addresses across the country, including here in the state. Um, and folks will be receiving a postcard in the mail that they will be able to uh, go online with and just follow a simple web link and uh, take five minutes or less, really, to answer the form and uh, be counted. And that's really what we're hoping that folks will do. Um, it helps save taxpayer money if folks can do that online and not have to be visited eventually by an enumerator who will come to doors the, uh, of households that haven't responded so far. So we're out there doing that work, and we really appreciate um, the governor's efforts on our behalf, on this behalf, and we hope that um, you know, as we move forward, uh, the word gets out there among all of Vermont's communities, regardless of citizenship status, regardless of your socio-demographic status. None of those things matter. What matters is that you're counted as a Vermonter. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael Harrington, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Labor. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. As a member of Vermont's Complete Count Committee, the Department of Labor is committed to the goal of generating an accurate and comprehensive count of Vermont's population during the 2020 Census. Ensuring a complete count will have a major impact on the department as well as the state as a whole. Data points published by the department, such as our state's monthly jobs report and local employment data, as well as analysis performed by the department's labor market information division are all derived from the census population data. Plainly, the more accurate the census, the more true our data is. This in turn drives decisions like policies to adopt or programs to fund or where to invest our money. For example, when we talk about refugee resettlement and new American incentive programs, that is based on census information. When we talk about equal pay and economic equality, that is based on census data. When we talk about tax relief, that is based on census data. These are just a few examples to illustrate the importance of having a complete count. More specifically, census data has a direct impact on how the federal government funds a variety of state programs, including the Department of Labor and which communities are eligible for special federal assistance. At the local level, this can translate into downtown redevelopment opportunities, available financing for businesses, and accessibility of services and benefits. There are still a large number of census jobs needed to be filled across the state, so whether your goal is to simply do your part and support your local community, or maybe earn a little extra cash, uh, I encourage everyone who's interested to apply to be a census taker. For those who are interested, there are many ways to apply, one of which is by visiting one of our 12 career resource centers across the state, where our staff have been working with the US Census Bureau now for more than a year to assist in filling these vacant positions. In addition, the Department of Labor and the state of Vermont's Department of Human Resources are looking at ways to look within state government to encourage state employees seeking additional part-time employment to consider this important role. As we encourage state employees to take part in this historic event and support their local communities, I would also like to encourage Vermont employers to encourage their employees to also take part in this opportunity. Through these joint efforts, the 2020 Census can prove to be a success for Vermont. Thank you, and now I'd like to invite Bob Stock from the Regional Census Center to say a few words. Thank you. Bob, thank you. 
I'd like to thank everyone here today, um, Governor, the leaders in the community, the trusted voices that are here to help us shape your future, the Vermont future, through the 2020 Census. Um, by the way, although I do work for the New York Regional Census Center, I am a Vermonter. I, live, I have lived here for 36 years now. Um, so I'm vitally interested in making sure that we get a complete count and an accurate count. And my message is simple. The census is now, as our responses can be collected in less than a month. Um, a successful census is easy to define, counting everybody once, only once, and in the right place. Um, but first, we have jobs, as um, um, Commissioner Harrington mentioned and others have mentioned. Although the census is a national event, in order to be successful, it first has to be conducted at the local level with local workers who understand and represent their community. I can tell you that we're currently hiring at a pay rate of 20 to $22 an hour. Uh, these are great part-time jobs. There are flexible hours. You can work in your own neighborhood, work evenings and weekends, and you will be helping your community. Uh, it's easy enough to apply. It's on the 2020census.gov jobs website. Uh, it doesn't take very long. Second, we need census ambassadors. Uh, we need trusted voices in every community sharing the message that the census is safe, it is easy, and it is important. We do, as the governor mentioned um, and others, that we do have the State Complete Count Commission. In addition to that, we have over 20 individual complete count committees working within Vermont. These are, some of them are town and city based, some of them are more county based. Uh, and they are bringing these trusted members of the community to get the message out about both the importance of the census and the jobs. We have over 600 partners in Vermont active that we're working with. All your responses, and, oh, second, in addition to that, um, we need to share the message that the census is safe, it's easy, and it is important. All your responses are private and confidential. It's safe. Title 13, which every census employee works under, it's federal law and it protects every piece of data we collect. That means we cannot release any information that identifies an individual or a household, period. We cannot share any information we collect that would identify an individual or a household with any federal, state, or local agency, including law enforcement. So be assured, the census is safe. And the census is easy. As others have mentioned, there are four ways to fill out your form and self-respond. Online for the first time, as well as by phone, and for the first time, the census will be available in 12 non-English languages. The, uh, these are toll-free numbers, by the way, on telephone, uh, and each one of these has its own unique individual toll-free number, and, the and it is answered by a live person. There's no, no voice prompt. Uh, in addition, if you prefer to fill it out by paper, you'll have that option as well. And finally, the most costly operation we do in the census is sending census takers door to door to collect the very information that you can complete online, over the phone, or on paper. So the census is easy. Uh, and again, as others have alluded to, it's important. Think money. Um, more than $675 billion from the federal government funding vital programs like Medicaid, SNAP, um, Section 8 housing, uh, Medicare Part B assistance, food stamps, on and on and on, um, school lunch. And think power. Um, legislative boundaries and congressional seats at stake. Yes, it's important. But I think one of the most important things to remember is that this is your census. Uh, we get one chance every 10 years to get it right. And I'm confident that by working together, we can achieve the most complete and accurate count possible for Vermont. Thank you. Governor? Thank you. We'll now uh, open it up to any on-topic questions first, <laughs> as is normal. <laughs> well, the mo most recent news heard about the census was that was the fight over the citizenship question. And for those who are, are undocumented, um, can you just address where that stands? Um, look at Bob first. Um, the citizenship question is not on the census. Uh, that was decided, I believe, last either spring or summer by the United States Supreme Court. Are you concerned particularly about New Americans, uh, others who might be um, scared away. It is, a it is a concern. Um, that is why we have partners that work within that community um, to make sure that, the, that those folks understand that the census is both important and it is safe. Uh, can you clarify the April 1st the, the census? 
is the date by which what happens? The official start of the census. It starts. And mm -hmm. But you will receive happens. mailers and different items days to weeks prior to that. Um, for example, like Alaska has already, in a sense, started because it's in a different zone specifically. But within that, you'll have a lot of announcement prior through mailers, uh, informational items on online. And then on April 1st, the census will roll out. And it concludes when? You said it concludes? Mm -hmm. well, now that, I would say more or less around up September into um, light October. And then the actual uh, ending and wind down will complete by the end of 2020. Finally, the, the GAO issued a report yesterday that said that it raised a lot of red flags about the census, about its security, uh, data security, mm -hmm. and as well as big challenges with recruiting across the country. Uh, does that all translate here as well? Hmm. I said for Vermont, when it comes to that, the census has kind of, in a sense, allowed us to know that the type of systems that they're using are going to be extremely um, protective of confidential information that is demographic or can pinpoint somebody. The most, I would say, we'd want to be aware of is how those other systems, for example, if you are web-based, you're going to be fine using the census. But if somebody in their own internal home or let's say business is not secure themselves, that's a different type of conversation with that entity. But for confidential data by, let's say, statutes of the federal government, it is important that this information not be um, breached, compromised in any way. So the census has, I would say, assured us in a variety of different ways that it is a strong system and they are very supportive of how it will actually interplay the rest of the year. As well, Stuart, um, I did receive uh, a phone call from someone on the federal level about the number of uh, census takers. And uh, they, they said uh, that we're short about 1,000 uh, in Vermont. And they're struggling to find people, as we are with everything else uh, in our, our state. Uh, we have uh, more, more jobs and we have people available. And uh, this is going to be a struggle for us as well. But that's why we wanted to emphasize that this is part time in nature. Uh, pays 20 to 22 dollars an hour. Uh, can do it nights and weekends. Uh, and this could be, uh, uh, it could be uh, students uh, over 18, I believe, uh, and uh, as well uh, those who are uh, retired or some are retired and need some extra cash uh, for a short period of time. Apart from this event, do you have other plans to sort of market that thing and? Uh I don't know what you've talked about, Jason, uh, within the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Harris, we can kind of come up a bit. One of the things that we are doing from the uh, Complete Council Committee for the state, we have connected with a variety of different partners. So, for example, uh, being the state librarian, some of our libraries want to actually have hiring events. Uh, Department of Labor will also be doing a variety of things. Uh, Capstone will have a variety of community action items across the state that they're looking to do hiring events or make computers or information accessible at those points so people are aware that there are jobs that they can partake in. So we have a lot of people who are trying to let as many people know that there is employment if they would like to have it when it comes to uh, the census. I'll just say that um, I think we'll see a more concerted effort just even from the Census Bureau itself as we ramp up to make people aware. Uh, from the jobs perspective, we are reaching out to local communities. We are working through our regional uh, career resource centers. We are using a variety of different means like social media uh, to get the word out there. But I think that's where um, you know we would ask each of you uh, to, to help us in getting the message out that there, there are positions available. So if there are people, whether they need extra cash or they are looking for work, there are positions available and, and we're happy to help them. And they can do that directly online from home or they can go to the libraries or even come into one of our resource centers and we'll assist them to uh, fill out an application. What are the consequences if you don't end up hiring if people do a job, a part-time job, and become full-time jobs, or do you stretch out the process? Or what mm -hmm. sort of with that, I'll let uh, Bob come and talk about that thoroughly, because these are positions with uh, the federal government. Pardon me. Um, these are part-time jobs. Most of them will end approximately July 30th. However, uh, at this point, if you're working for the United States Census Bureau, you have the federal government on your resume. Um, and you do have the opportunity, of course, on the USA job site to see if there's something that's there of interest to you. But um, most of the jobs, as I say, are temporary and would end July 30th. There are a few that might extend a little bit longer. 
I think. And I believe you were asking um, what happens if we yeah, don't right complete by <laughs> July 30th, right? Not filling those thousand jobs. Yeah. Um, and, and our goal is to make sure that we uh, do that count. And if we run into difficulties at that point in time, we'll probably be taking extra measures of some sort uh, to be contemplated. Is that all the on topic? <laughs> Was there, was there a particular trigger? Uh, you, you set up this commission in November. The census is still six weeks away-ish. Um, is there a particular reason you're doing this event now? Well, I think it's, from my standpoint, uh, to a couple of reasons. One, uh, just to make sure that Vermonters are acclimated and, and understanding what's coming and how important this is. Uh, but as well, uh, you know, the struggles we have with finding uh, people to fill these positions uh, needs a little bit of lead time. So. Uh, we want to make sure we get out to as many people as possible uh, to let them know uh, that there's, uh, there's something here for you. So it's really about more of a public service uh, campaign uh, and something that uh, I think is vitally important to the state. And can you just clarify, what message are you sending to undocumented people who uh, are in this country? Yeah. You, uh, what message do you want to send to those who are living in this country? I want to make sure that they understand uh, that they're safe, uh, that this information will not be used against them. Uh, this will help our state, uh, but, uh, but again, I just want them to have comfort uh, that we're not going to utilize this. The federal government's not going to utilize this information for anything else. But we need to count everyone here. And it won't be shared with law enforcement? It will not be shared with law enforcement or any other entities. It's just for the census itself. Despite the problems we've had at DMV? Despite those issues at the DMV. This is totally separate. You probably have uh, you probably have friends and neighbors who are sort of suspicious of government by nature, and we probably have <laughs> more than our share of those people in Vermont. We talk about new American communities, but that's a sizable component of Vermont as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they don't trust uh, their government, uh, and when we uh, have to do everything we can to convince them otherwise, uh, this is a, a struggle. I'm sure it's a struggle every 10 years. <laughs> Um, and this is nothing new, uh, but uh, but it seems as though uh, with uh, the the number of, uh, of of those suspicious for different reasons grows, uh, this is going to be more of a challenge for us. But again, that's why we have to make sure that we get the message out and give them comfort that we're we're actually here to help in some respects, and it'll help all of us in the long run. I I, I could add sure. something to Absolutely. that. Just you know, the folks that are suspicious of their government, um, this is really about getting counted so that their taxpayer dollars come back to our state. So it's a way to take that power back and keep it for themselves and keep it local here in the state. And I think that's a message that might resonate with some folks that would otherwise not be interested in uh, having the federal government uh, involved in their daily lives. Anyone else? Any other questions on topic? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The uh, Senate's about to uh, try to override your veto on minimum wage. Uh, the Senate leader, Tim Ash, said that he finds your administration to be uh, uniquely unwilling to work on compromises, pointing specifically to the minimum wage bill. What are your thoughts on that? Well, this was a compromise that they, the Senate and the House uh, came up with. We weren't at the table, uh, so to speak. Um, and so they came up with their agreement. And, uh, and it's not acceptable to me. Uh, that's why I decided to veto it. I have no doubt that uh, it, it'll be overridden in the, in the Senate. It appears the numbers are on their side. So then we'll, we'll see what happens in the, in the other body. Was there any compromise to be found on minimum wage? Um, well, you, you never know. I mean, hopefully, if it's, uh, if it's sustained, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But you know, from my standpoint, I, I've said this consistently over the last number of years that I just don't believe uh, artificially raising the minimum wage is going to help anyone. And, uh, and, and I just feel that it will hurt the, the economy overall, particularly the rural parts of our state. And I'm concerned about that. So how can you raise minimum wage without artificially raising the minimum wage? I mean, it sounds like there is no compromise in your mind. Well, again, we can, we can focus on growing the economy. Um, and and the, ra the wages will raise uh, by that growth. Uh, and I think that we've seen that. And, and I believe that we need to do more of it. I mean, this money just doesn't come out of nowhere. I mean, if you, if you take, uh, use whatever 
um, whatever math you want. Uh, I've seen some, uh, I think the, the pro tem invention uh, number that doesn't seem to add up to me, but, but if you use this number, um, you're talking about $200 million. It comes out of somewhere, it comes out of the economy. Uh, somebody has to pay for it. So uh, we're fragile in this state, and particularly when you go up in the Northeast Kingdom, all along the, uh, the uh, uh, Connecticut River corridor, eastern parts of our state, all parts of our state outside of Burlington. Um, and as I said before, even New York realized uh, that uh, they did it in zones, four zones, because they recognized uh, that they were different parts of the state uh, that are more susceptible uh, to economic uh, burden. Was there a minimum wage that you could have spent months at the table with Democratic legislators you know, not going to be a compromise on this particular issue? Well, again, I think that, that what I've said uh, is uh, New York uh, took, took it upon themselves and had regions, different economic regions. You know, I'm, I'm more than willing to talk about it, but I think there was a uh, maybe not in this conversation, but uh, two years ago, I believe that there was an amendment on the floor in the Senate uh, to just carve out one re region, the northwest uh, area of our state, around the Burlington area, and they could absorb it, absorb it much easier uh, than the Northeast Kingdom. So maybe that's the place to start. How confident are you that you'll be in the, um, when it comes to the House, that you'll be able to sustain the veto? I think it's going to be very, very close. Uh, in the House, it could go either way. Your feeling about that hasn't changed because of the paid family leave, which would seem like an easier lift for House leadership than the minimum wage. Well, no, it may be because of it. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, politics will take place um, for those who voted against uh, increasing the minimum wage on the other side of the aisle, I'm sure there's incredible pressure on them uh, to try and override my veto, regardless of how they feel about, regardless of how their constituents might feel. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. What's your message to the 40,000 uh, who will be denied a larger paycheck because of your veto? Well, again, I believe uh, that we, we have in place uh, that the wages are going to increase. Uh, when I was in the Senate uh, those 12 years ago, and we had this conversation, we had this uh, debate on the floor of the Senate, and I was convinced to vote for an increase in the minimum wage and uh, to tie it to the uh, cost of living increase uh, every single year. Uh, and we've done that. So it's not as though uh, there's not increases uh, coming uh, to those who are making minimum wage. But I would say, uh, if, we can, uh, if we can help in any way, we have a lot of jobs available. If we can help with training, uh, trying to give them a, a lift up uh, to some of those higher paying jobs, we want to help in that regard. I think all of us have the common goal of, uh, of supporting Vermonters, having them uh, be able to keep more of what they earn, keep more in their pocket. Um, but we have a different pathway to getting there. And one of the ways we could do that is not putting any more burden on them either from a tax standpoint. In your uh, recent comments on climate issues, you've talked about the fact that your administration has taken a proactive stance and has tried to pursue action while the legislature seemed more focused on taxation and deadlines and things like that. Could you, you know, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what, what we did uh, last year, I proposed uh, last year, the last session, what I'm proposing uh, this year, uh, it's actually action items, uh, whether it's with uh, incentives for EVs or infrastructure or trying to bring more, uh, more focus on some of the energy storage, which I think is essential as we move forward. Um, so we're actually doing something about it. And what I'm seeing uh, is a pattern of uh, how are we going to pay for something we don't even know how much it's going to cost, and, and there's very few action items that I'm seeing. So I'm trying to shift the debate. Like, if you don't believe we're doing enough, then let's have that debate and let's prioritize. Uh, maybe, maybe it means putting more money into EV incentives or more into infrastructure or whatever it is that we're promoting or weatherization, uh, for instance. We're putting, uh, we put a lot of money into weatherization every single year. Um, but, but if we're not doing enough, uh, let's, uh, let's have that debate and, and let's actually do something about it. And let's prioritize, and it may mean uh, that we have to 
not do something in another area. But let's live within our means and prioritize the areas uh, in the areas that we uh, we have common interests. Which is the other side of that is living within our means. You're against uh, raising the pool of revenue in any way to allow us to do more. Yeah. You, you reprioritize. Right. Where you want it. As we if we talked about, there's a couple of different ways uh, to have. Vermonters keep more of what they earn. One way is not to burden them with any more taxes. Uh, so I'm saying let's live within, we're already a very high tax state. Uh, many Vermonters are feeling the burden of some of the actions we've taken in this, in this building. Um, let's, uh, let's live within that, though, those parameters. And uh, we have to do it in our own daily lives every single day, our own households, our own businesses, and you have to prioritize it. And you have to think about, you know, want and need. What is it you actually need? And what do you what do you want? And differentiate between the two. And you sometimes have to make difficult decisions. And I'm saying uh, we may have to make a difficult difficult decision here, and prioritize those areas. For instance, uh, I I said, if we have a surplus at the end of the year, uh, let's take part of that and put it towards climate change uh, initiatives, things that will help. And I, and I would say the focus might be weatherization. And if we took 25% of that surplus and did that, and if you, and if you compare it, you know, if it was a, a year like last year, that'd be $10 million more uh, that we could spend for weatherization that would help Vermonters. Do you think the legislature has uh, not come to the table to discuss concrete plans as your suggestion? Well, we're, we're still in the midst of, uh, of the session. Uh, I'm hopeful uh, that we can find areas of common agreement. Uh, and then maybe we'll shift uh, some of this focus. Uh, I think they've come a long ways in some of the, the bills that I've seen. Um, and we're willing to do more uh, to, to make sure that we, we uh, arrive at a place that we can both agree to and, and make sure that we focus on, on the areas that will benefit Vermont. There, there does seem to be a, a backing away from the short and medium term goals that Vermont has set for itself. Uh, are you focused pretty much solely on the 90 by 2050 and less concerned with the like 2028, 20, 2030, 20, 20 whatever? Yeah, I think I've, I tried to explain this in uh, previous press conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the trajectory is a little bit different because of technology changes and acceptance and behavior changes and so forth. Uh, so. Uh, p putting a, an, an artificial uh, goal in place by a certain date uh, that isn't attainable uh, doesn't help us, uh, and it opens us, to, uh, us up to all kinds of liability. I'm just saying, uh, let's agree to uh, a long-term goal. Uh, maybe there's a midterm that we can agree to, and then let's move from there. Let's assess what we're doing now, uh, and uh, let's see what we can do, how much that's going to cost, and, and how we're going to get there, like we did with uh, water quality. And I think that we should learn from that experience. And, and it took, uh, admittedly, uh, it, took, uh, it took a lawsuit uh, for, for us to, to get to that point. But let's learn from that, and let's not have the lawsuit. Let's actually do something about it. You talk about setting goals for the state already had goals that it was on track to missing terribly. And part of the reason, and this is the reason for the Global Warming Solutions Act, is to say you can't just set goals, but they have to be mandatory. Um, your administration talked about letting that kick in in like 2050. Uh, why? Well, I don't, I don't think that's completely accurate. I mean, we're not trying to push it off completely till 2050. Right, but not, not the sort of mandatory. As I just described, let's let's figure out where we want to get to. Um, maybe there's a midterm uh, point that we can agree to, uh, and uh, goals are, are important. Uh, but I don't want to open up us to a, a lawsuit that would just slow down the progress of whatever we're trying to do. But why would setting goals? What makes you think that setting goals now would be any more without some sort of additional enforcing mechanism would be any more sort of? than the goals were set, that were set years ago. Because, again, I think we're taking concrete action uh, is, is the most important thing. Uh, and if we just are, are debating about arbitrary type goals, uh, that doesn't get us to where we want to go. And I'm saying, let's focus on action. Let's actually do something about it. Peter, is there anything else you, you want to add? Uh, you've been part of the conversation. Sure. Thanks, Governor. I, I think well, there's a couple of clarification points. We're not changing any of the proposed goals. We're not changing any of the desire to make those requirements. What we're saying is that we need to have a plan in place and figure out what that's going to cost and work towards that plan. 
And instead of having litigation be the trigger that makes us do that work, let's make sure that we're, we're all agreeing we're going to do that work and prioritize that. And in the language that we propose, there's actually, instead of litigation triggers, there's automatic triggers to reopen that work, to say, what are we doing to fill the gap that we missed it by if we miss it, right? That's, let's, let's short circuit that step and get right back to work and figure out what we need to, di what dials we need to turn in order to make sure we make that progress. That, that's just a different form of approach that gets rid of the hook of litigation and gets us to actually getting to work and shortens that timeline. So what is it about those triggers that would actually force the future administration today to meet the targets that have been set? I mean, what were the sort of carrots and sticks that are built in? Sure, there are timelines associated with updating the plans and then putting it, getting to work on implementing those plans. And so happy to talk with you more about it, but that's, that's the, that ultimately that's what we need to do. If we don't make a target or if we don't make the requirement or whatever we're going to call it, then we need to figure out what, what changes we need to make. That may be regulatory changes that, that, that's proposed in the current bill. It may be different incentives. We need to align with the current technology and make sure that we're pulling the levers that need to be pulled. And so that's ultimately what the plan needs to look at. And so it's, if we reopen the plan and get to work on updating the plan and then get to work on implementing, that's the thing that will actually get us there. And as well, I think uh, assessing, and, and they've, again, the uh, House has come a long ways in their proposal, assessing what we're doing now is important and valuable because maybe we're spending a lot of money in the wrong areas. Maybe we should be focusing on, on areas that give us uh, the, the best return. And whether, again, we spend, I think it's up to $12 million in uh, the Agency of Human Services for weatherization. I know Efficiency Vermont spends a, a lot more money. I think all told, uh, we, we spend uh, 35 to $40 million on weatherization every single year. But if we're not doing that effectively and efficiently, maybe we should do more in that area. Maybe we're doing something else in another area that isn't giving us the best return on our, on our hard-earned taxpayer dollars. With, with water quality, it was important, I think, to come up with, it's going to cost us a billion dollars, estimated. And we, we were able to, to figure out that's going to be $50 million a year over the next 20 years. So we came to that conclusion. And, 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 and that's what I think we ought to do here, so that we don't just set an arbitrary goal and, and have no idea who's going to pay for it, how it's going to be paid for, and just open us up to all kinds of liability. I don't think any of us should be off the hook on this. Uh, not future legislators, not future administrations. Let's deal with this now and actually, and actually put something into action. To be fair to uh, arbitrary goals, uh, the Vermont goals were set uh, by looking at the IPCC's recommendations for limiting the, the impact of climate change. So they aren't really arbitrary, they are, they are based on something. Well, again, I think behavior change is going to half of our emissions right now, I think we all know, uh, are related to transportation. Uh, and what is, what is it we're going to do to shift uh, in, in, in that uh, area? We do, we do relatively well in terms of uh, electrification, in terms of power, about half of our emissions. But we, with, uh, with uh, Hydro-Quebec and, and others, uh, we do pretty well. Um, so we have that other 50% to take care of, and so how do we shift how we, what we drive and how we do that? And I would say it's through incentives, behavior change, uh, trying to get to more competition. Uh, I think there's all kinds of ways of doing it that we, we put into place. Um, and if, if that's not enough, let's talk about what it is that it would take to get there. And so, again, I think we're, we're, we're focusing on the wrong areas and putting more of the burden on future legislatures and, and administration far beyond any of us there who are debating it today. Do you think you're getting a bad rap on climate issues? No, I, I, I th it's all fair. Um, it's okay. I, I think that the climate change is real. We have to do everything we can. I just have to be realistic about it. And, uh, and just to set a, a goal and then just, you know, wipe our hands and say we've done our job isn't good enough. I think you have to put some action into place. <coughs> There's a proposal in the building uh, to prohibit Vermont schools from flying uh, anything other than the national and state flag. Um, I guess is uh, really focused on the controversy surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Is that the proposal that would be would you approve or what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I, at first I've heard of it uh, actually, but uh, but I think it's a, a local control type of issue. I think you should be able to fly whatever flag you want. You're it would not. Um, there's not a problem here that needs fixing. I don't believe so. No. Your administration signed a five-year contract for a blockchain technology to track the kind of industry. Um, why do you think that's an effective use of state funds? I think blockchain is the future. Uh, I think that uh, using this technology uh, to make sure that we we protect and track uh, the, the the use of this, uh, I think it protects everyone. So. I think it's just a, a good use of this new technology, and, and I think it can be utilized in other areas as well. Do you know how much the state's spending on the contract? I don't. I do not. And is it something you'd like to see expanded to other agricultural fields? Why just that? Well, I don't know if it's just agriculture. I think it's just the the concept of blockchain uh, technology could be utilized for almost anything. I think about it in terms of uh, um, some of like motor vehicle uh, with uh, with proof of origin and so forth. Uh, they wait. A long periods of time um, to get their title, uh, and maybe with this technology, maybe we could utilize it to get uh, to be able to make sure these transactions happen quicker uh, when you're trying to pay off a, a mortgage company or so forth. I think that uh, that that's that's the part that that I think is uh, is uh, exciting about the future in terms of blockchain. But it could be it could be used in other areas as well. I, I don't know enough about it. I don't think any of us do, unless you do. Um, but uh, but I think it's something that uh, that we should explore. Explain blockchain in 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Governor, the uh, Super Tuesday is coming up, and Vermont is part of that. I'm wondering if you have uh, share with us who you might be backing. Sir. Well, it. Uh, uh, suffice it to say, I think I, I've said enough uh, last week uh, to give you an idea uh, who I probably won't be supporting. Um, Governor Weld uh, is someone who is on the on the ticket. Uh, I've met with him before. I think a lot of uh, uh, of, uh, of him and, and his platform. Uh, so I would be supporting him. Are you gonna, is he going to come? Early? I'm not I sure. Know. Yeah, I have no idea. So the tax and regulated bill is continuing to move along. I don't think everybody in here knows your concerns by now. Um, but um, some of the recent changes to the bill, have you been paying any attention to those in the House side? Have you any yeah, I haven't uh, paid a lot of attention uh, to the bill other than the, my three conditions. Uh, and I've said, you know, if they meet my conditions that I have, uh, it's pretty simple, that, uh, that I would, I'm, I'm not at no, I'm at uh, yes if. So, yeah, do you have any thoughts about those, some of the revenue projections at this point? Um, it's, I don't think, I don't believe it's a lot of money. Um, so we shouldn't count on that for, for solving all of our, our problems here in Vermont, our financial problems. But um, again, I've, I've said before, I think the after school uh, program uh, could be one area that it could be utilized in. The, um, the VSEA, they're rolling out their own plan. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, for the replacement of Woodside, there, there's two potential plans, like a no eject, no reject facility. Um, I wonder if you've seen the plans yet from Steve Howard and what you think. I, I haven't personally, uh, but we're, uh, we're still planning, uh, forging ahead. Uh, the closure, uh, from my point of view, will happen July 1. Do you know when we could see the RFPs? RFPs for closure, or for the the company or the organization that will uh, eventually provide the. Service. Yeah, we're we're working that out. Uh, we're we're we have a plan in place. Uh, we're looking for other opportunities as well. <coughs> okay. okay. Oh, one other thing. Uh, tomorrow is a special day for lots of many um, women around the country, and I am sure the man that you are, you. Would, I want to share with us your plans. So. <laughs> so, it wouldn't, if I told you, Stuart, it wouldn't be a surprise then, would it? <laughs> you won't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> you never. <laughs> I just want to make sure you get it right if, you, if I tell you. Uh, suffice it to say, I do know uh, uh, tomorrow is a big day. <laughs> Are you going to open your wallet? I usually do. <laughs> 
within the constraints of available <laughs> funds. <laughs> within, within the parameters of my wallet, <laughs> I am not going to extend beyond that. Thank you very much for coming in.